Good afternoon. Two years ago, I was given a task to design and lead the implementation of a formal and secure software development lifecycle. My talk today is inspired by the approach that I took and the approach that I would take if I was given a similar task again. I'm going to give a quick introduction about myself, then I will cover some useful standards, after which I will cover the core building blocks in establishing the formal software development lifecycle, and then I will cover how we can add security layers on top of that. So I've been doing IT security and software development for the past 20 years. I have participated on multiple software development teams. I have led software development teams. I have designed uh, software development lifecycles. I have assisted companies with performing vulnerability assessments, penetration testing, source code auditing, with regards to security vulnerabilities. I've assisted companies with complying with the payment card industry data security standards, the payment application data security standard. I've assisted companies with implementing information security management systems based on ISO 27001. And in my role as a manager at KPMG, I would also regularly audit software development life cycles as part of either an external or an internal audit. The first standard I want to mention is ISO 27001. And those of you who are familiar with ISO 27001, you know that this is not actually a software development related standard. This is a standard that guides you on how to implement a formal information security management system. So why is that important? Why is that the first standard that, I want, uh, that I'm mentioning? The reason is this. In order to be able to establish a formal and secure software development lifecycle, we need a strong and secure foundation. And what, some of the things that we get from ISMS implementation based on ISO 27001 include things such as executive management conveying their support for IT security by issuing an information security policy. We get a formal process for access control where management will actually have to sit down and decide and document how should access uh, be managed, who is allowed to apply for access, who is allowed to approve access, uh, what's the path. Once this has been documented, it can actually be audited once a year. Of course, when should access be revoked? Another thing close related, backups. Uh, once you have formalized backups, you've documented how backups are being performed, how you should recover from backups, you've documented backup frequency. So for very key information systems, so let's take an example as your uh, source code repository. For a small company, you might want to take a backup once a day. Other cases, if you have 50, 100, 150, 200 developers, you can do once an hour, once every 15 minutes a minute. Or in other cases, you just want a separate uh, server room, a different geographical location, just mirroring data between the two. Another thing that's very valuable is to have a business continuity plan. So this, again, means that management with their budget, with the risk assessments, they've decided the priority of recovery of the IT systems. So in case there's a fire in your server room, they know exactly how long it should take you to recover. And again, for a small company, for it to take a couple of days, let's say, a uh, fire in a server room to establish the network, your domain controllers, your production, development, and testing environment, and then your source uh, control repository, is acceptable, while well, in other cases when you have 200 software developers, <coughs> that's going to be very expensive and can cost you a lot of money. Those of you who have heard about ISO 27000 standards uh, may have heard about the ISO 27000 standard series. I just mentioned ISO 27001, which is a requirement standard that defines requirements for establishing an information security management system. There's plenty of other 27000 standards out there. So, this ISO 27002 gives you guidelines on how to implement the controls referenced in ISO 27001. ISO 27005 gives you guidance on how to perform risk assessments. And there's plenty of other ISO 27000 standards, but the one that I want to mention is ISO 27034. This standard is independent of software development methodology, and it gives you a number of controls that you can plug into your software development process, and while doing that, you will, if you do that, you will achieve a secure software development lifecycle. Parts one and two have already been uh, published. Part four was scheduled, and uh, part four was supposed to define 
the certification requirements. And the idea was that if you implement 27,034, you could actually get your uh, software development lifecycle certified to ISO 27,034, just like you can get your information security management system certified to 27,001. However, uh, part four has been canceled. I'm not sure if it's indefinite or not. But even though you cannot get ISO 27,034 certified yet, uh, a lot of companies are claiming compliance. And this includes a lot of big companies, including Microsoft. There are a couple of other standards I want to mention. Uh, those of you that work for a company that handle payment card data, such as credit card numbers, you need to comply with the payment card industry data security standard. If you're developing software that is handling payment card data, such as credit card uh, numbers, you need to comply with the payment application data security standard. But if you're a software development company and you're not doing neither of those things, you can still download those standards for free, go through all the controls, and select the ones that you like to implement. What I like about the PCI and PA DSS standards is that, first of all, they're free. And the other thing is that you get a list of controls. So you get three columns. First, a list of the controls. Second column explains how you can implement each control. And the third column gives guidance to an assessor or an auditor how he should evaluate whether a particular control has been implemented correctly or not. So this should give you a pretty deep understanding on the controls in question. And keeping in mind that PCI and PADSS are for free, if you just want a single copy of ISO 27001 and 27002, you're going to have to pay a few hundred dollars. If you want to get a single copy of part one and two of ISO 27034, that's going to be a few hundred dollars. So I always like things when they're free. The last standard that I want to mention is the Open Software Assurance Maturity Model. It's been maintained by the Open Web Application Security Project. I'm sure most of you are familiar with OWASP Top 10. They have a lot of cool uh, other projects. This includes one of them. And what they've done is they've taken the software development process and they've broken it down into four different business functions. And then each business function has been broken down into three different security practices. And for every security practice, you get a questionnaire. Have you implemented X? Have you implemented Y? And etc. And based on your response, you're going to get a score between zero and three. So this is good in two parts. First of all, first of all, it will tell us where we are today, and the other part is we can actually set a goal for the future. So if we score one particular security practice, then we can set a goal that within the end of the year or next year we want to reach two, and it actually tells us what it is that we need to do to implement it. I do want to mention that there are plenty of other standards and guidelines out there that guide you in implementing and designing a formal secure software development lifecycle. However, I felt that a lot of people are usually familiar with these and can use these. There's no right way, even though I really like my way. <coughs> but what I want to do now is I want to cover the core building blocks in establishing a formal software development lifecycle. And they want, the way I want to do this is I want to use an imaginary small and medium sized enterprise where the uh, software development maturity level is at its infancy. And then I want to cover how it slowly adds control by control to that process. Before I do that, I do want to mention that prior for me uh, going on this journey, I did read a lot of articles relating to the issue. And pretty much all of the articles I read they came up with the same number that you should expect the implementation time to take between two and three years if you want to establish a formal and secure software development lifecycle. In our case, it was about a year and a half, but you have to keep in mind there are a lot of things can, that can play a part. How many things have you already implemented? How many software developers do you have? How open are your software developers to changes? And also, how loaded are your software developers? Do you have a lot of um, Unrealistic deadlines. People are familiar with that. But what will inevitably happen when you start creating new processes or training your software developers to use new tools is that it will slow down the software development during a certain period, the learning period. But as it was in our case, in all the articles that I read, there's always a positive return on investment. 
So once everything's in place and you start working on your machine, you're, you're really good. And I guess the only thing that I would add is that, well, if you decide to go on this journey, then I would recommend, from my own experience, not to try to change too many things at the same time. If you have 10 different things that you want to change, just change one at a time, let people adapt, and move it slowly on. Okay, so let's get back to our uh, imaginary company. I love talking about imaginary things. So the first thing I want to do is we're going to decide on a software development methodology. And in our case, we're going to choose Agile and we're going to use Scrum. The next step that we want to do is we want to formalize this. So what I mean by formalize, in my case, I'm talking about documenting it, or from an IT auditing point of view, you want to design it. So one common, I consider error, the thing that I don't like seeing when people start formalizing things or documenting things, is they start to document all these unnecessary things. So you don't need to document what is Scrum. You don't want a four-page essay, what is Scrum. You should always assume that the person reading your documentation should have some basic understanding. So what you want to document is, how are you going to implement Scrum? And this could be some basic things. This could be, what should be the composition of your Scrum team? Like the number of people, should, do you always want to have uh, one database person, always want to have one person that knows system X or system Y? How long should your sprints be? Should it be two weeks, four weeks, six weeks? Should the Scrum team be allowed to select these uh, the periods? Who is allowed to create a user story? Who is allowed to create a task? Who is allowed to add a task to an already running sprint? So once you've decided on all of this, then uh, you might want to digitize it. Once I did an audit of a financial institution in Iceland, and they had just recently adopted Scrum, I meet their head of IT, and he's really excited. He's talking about how how the speed of software development has increased. He shows us the documents. We go through the documents. Everything looks really well. And then he brings us into the offices of some of the software developers, and he shows us the whiteboard. And he goes like, yes, so here you can see we have these post-its, and on the far left, we have tasks that are in this sprint that have not yet started. In the next column, we have uh, tasks that have been started. The column after that, we have a list of tasks that have been started but have hit a roadblock and are now stalled. The next one, we have a list of tasks that are being tested. And then the final column, we have a list of uh, all the tasks that have been closed, that have been tested past testing and have been finalized. We're like, okay, this looks really good. But tell us, how do you keep track of your change history? And then he's like, oh, they didn't quite think of that, so they just threw away the post-it notes. So that's why I would say the second thing you want to do is, or technically the third thing, you want to digitize your Scrum board. And there's plenty of tools out there, like Microsoft TFS comes with a digital Scrum board. You have Jira, you have ColorUpNet, you have Trello. Because um, you want to be able to keep, especially if you have software, that you're developing that is either performing financial transactions or creating information for people to base transactions on, or healthcare related uh, equipment, you, I mean, you want to have a change history and try to make sure nobody sneaked anything in there that they shouldn't have. The next thing I would do is select the source control system. Most of you will probably already have a source control system in place, but this is a chance to change it up. Even on theory, you could change your source control system at any time. During this implementation phase, you'll be training your software developers to use new tools, uh, follow new processes, so this is the ideal time to actually implement a new source control system. So we're going to pick subversion. And of course, every step, uh, every single step that we add something new to the software development process, we would update our software development process document. So I'm going to stop mentioning that more or less now on. But ideally, it should be a live document. So you can put some, some rules in there, something you want to do. But if it doesn't work, don't be afraid to go back, remove it, add something new. So now we're going to use Subversion, but how are we going to use it? Do we want all our software developers to be working on the trunk? 
or do you want our, all of our software developers to branch out any single change and then branch back into the trunk with the changes? Or do we want all our software developers to be always working on the trunk, except if they're making changes that they believe will break the software? Should they then branch out or branch back in? These are simple questions, but it's really useful to have an informed decision on these things and having them documented. So this, this sort of stuff just prevents misunderstanding. And that's really a big part of why we're formalizing the process to begin with. Prevent misunderstanding, just optimize the entire process. Uh, one other thing that I want to mention is uh, release versioning. We actually we have a problem with that in Iceland. Uh, in the past, when I've been assisting companies with performing penetration testing, I found countless uh, security vulnerabilities in software that they bought from Icelandic software vendors. What happens is they contact the so software vendor, notify them of the security vulnerability, they get a really nice thank you letter back. A few weeks later, they get an email saying, hey, you know, Thank you for notifying us about the security vulnerability. We've now fixed it, but if you want to get the latest version with the, uh, if you want to get the security packages, the only way to get the security update is if you upgrade to the latest version. And it's it's going to cost you a few tens of thousands of dollars. So, for a big company, it may not be a big deal, but for small companies, uh, it can be very painful. So, in release versioning, some like most uh, source control tools such as um, Subversion, you can actually tag a version of your software whenever you release it. So you may have version 1.1, 1.0, 2.0, 2.1. And let's say a security vulnerability is discovered that applies to the entire line, and it's just it's a one-liner that you need to fix, hash kill injection or something. Then if you've done your release versioning, then you can just check out every single version, do this minor update, create new binaries, get them to your clients, and it will increase your client security, and your reputation. Okay, so now we've we've decided on a software development methodology, we've formalized it, we've decided on a source control system. The next thing we want to do is we want to connect the two. There is no reason that I can think of that a software developer should be allowed to commit some source code without having it approved by either the business owner or uh, the scrum master. And ideally, you want to be able to, especially for sensitive software, you want to be able to track every source code change to a particular task. There was one case uh, when I was working with a software developer with over a decade of experience in software development, but who was new to the Scrum methodology, and this software developer really enjoyed trying to increase performance of already running services. So what he, he was once tasked with adding a function to an already running service, and he completed the task, which was fine. That those changes went through testing, went into production, but then everything crashed, so we had to do a rollback. And when we started uh, looking through things, we found out that he had modified a different service. His intention was to optimize it, but at the time we did not have automated, we had not yet implemented automated testing. So we did manual testing, and it was based on release notes, so what had been changed. So what we had to do is basically we had to chat with the software developer and then we chat with all the other software developers and just said, you know, we really appreciate it if you want to do optimization of our services, that's really positive. Also, if you see some security bugs or just any software development bugs that you want to fix, what we want to just re request that you talk to either the business owner or the scrum master to get a task for that particular thing because we want to be able to track every code change to a particular task. And he got on board. And I believe it was just one case where he got rejected to add it, add a task on an already running sprint, but he got to put it in, in, in the sprint afterwards. So that was actually quite useful. Ideally, you should have at least three different environments. You should have a software development environment, a testing environment, a production environment. And if your production environment means either internal or external users, actively using it, you might even want to have a fourth environment, sort of a staging environment. We had a minor issue as well with the same developer. At one point, he had been given a task. Uh, similarly, he was asked to add a function to an already existing service, which he did, and he was now, like, he was creating tasks for everything extra, so we were able to keep track of all changes. Uh, and he implements this, 
At the time, he had administrative access both to the testing environment and to the production environment. And he was requested, can you please put the binders into the testing environment? Then it got tested, and he was asked to put it into the production environment. Our client started using this new function, everything worked great. A few weeks later, another software developer was asked to add a new function to the same service. He does the same thing, uh, it goes through testing, and at this time we still didn't have our automated test up and running. So the only thing that we tested was based on the release notes. And it passes testing, we put it into production, and I start getting phone calls. Our clients are asking us, where's this uh, the function that we added a few weeks ago? So apparently it was missing. Uh, so we did a rollback, sort of scratching our heads, and tried to go through the source code. We could not find the, the first function that was added. So after much digging around, we were able to find out that the software developer had been doing some optimization exercise and checked out the source code to a different directory than which he usually worked in. And he did the task that he was assigned to did that on that particular directory. And when he was asked to put those services into the testing environment, he basically built it, put those binaries there, and what may even have happened is that he may even, when he was asked to put those binaries into production, he may have rebuilt uh, the service with some other minor modifications and put that into production, those binaries. So not the actually tested binaries. But I mean, everything worked, so it wasn't a big issue then, it wasn't until we decided to update it. But the way we decided to uh, solve this issue was we removed his administrative access to the testing environment and the production environment and decided to enforce separation of duties. So we had another person that got the responsibility for putting our services into testing, the testing environment. And the way that would be done, they would check out the latest source code, build the binaries, put binaries into the testing environment. When they would pass, they would take those binaries, put them into the production environment. And also something just to keep in mind, if you have sensitive data, usually in your production environment, you don't want your software testers or your software developers to have access to that. And even in a testing environment, you don't want software developers to be accidentally interrupting tests. So if you enforce certain uh, access control, um, that's probably a smart idea. So I'm gonna cover how to add more security. So what we've covered so far, is basically we're formalizing things. The way I look at it, we've been adding a lot of security so far. We're preventing misunderstandings, we're preventing like potential downtime, but now we're actually going to add security layers to the uh, software development lifecycle. So once we had I mean, all those processes in place, the next thing we did was we decided to start differentiating between bugs and security bugs. And we updated the document, like always, and we defined if a critical security bug is reported, then the business owner and either a security architect or chief information security officer, they have to decide how to respond to that vulnerability within 24 hours. For other security bugs, a decision has to be made within three business days. Okay, so we updated the document, but now we have to start training both our software developers and uh, our testers to be able to identify what's a security bug from this a different type of bug and how to evaluate them. So the next thing that we did was the secure coding training. And there's plenty of trainings out there. You can find, I believe, OWASP has some old project, has some videos that demonstrate OWASP top 10. You can probably find some free YouTube videos. Then you have some uh, companies like uh, Code Bashing. You can buy access there. And of course, there's plenty of computer security companies that are happy to take your money to give you some training. But what I would recommend is whatever training path you decide on, you should adjust the training to your environment. If you're developing in .NET, don't buy a class on PHP secure coding practices. In my experience, the more you can associate with the environment that people are already working in, the easier it is for them to understand. So if you're doing .NET, get training in .NET. Doing Java, Java, etc. And also another interesting thing is, this probably, I mean, it didn't work in our case in the beginning, the first time we did the secure coding training, but in the future, 
the next time you hold a secure coding training, try to use an input from your reported security bugs. In my experience, it's, it's much more useful to be able to say, these are the security bugs that were discover actually discovered in our software. And, you know, you did not say you did that, but, you know, this is something that happened with our company. You want to explain that security vulnerability, possibly explain why it's a vulnerability, might show you how it's exploited, but the most important thing is you want to explain how to prevent it. Uh, people tend to like that a lot. Okay, so once this extra security layer has been added, uh, the next thing that we did was we started a secure coding practices document. And this is a good place to put secure coding practices, such as, let's say, input validation. And ideally, in my opinion, it should be as easy to use as possible. You, preferably, you just want to have code snippets that you can copy-paste for your developers. So uh, input filtering, or let's say that you were writing services for multiple companies that you know role is written a little bit differently, and you were would frequently have to uh, do user authentication with username and password. Just decide on okay, you're also using bcrypt. This is how you're going to do it. Just have a have a little always have a little bit of text describing why it's important, and then just have a code snippet that you can copy paste. Same thing with session management or anything that you file find applicable. And whenever a new security bug is discovered, you can, it's a good idea to look back at your secure coding practice uh, document and uh, evaluate, is it possible that this security vulnerability would happen again, or that it is somewhere else? If yes, then you might want to put some text into your secure coding practice document. Okay, so we're, we're, we've added this extra layer. The next layer we're going to add, or we added, was we added a design and design review layer. So what this means is, whenever a software developer was starting his sprint, he would write a design document. It was not a complex document, so let's say that he was supposed to implement a new function. He would simply write, this is the expected input, this is the expected output, and this is what we're going to do. And of course, if it was uh, an entire service, it might be a few pages. And this was turned out to be very useful. It prevented a lot of misunderstanding. There were cases where the business owner was not clear enough, or actually broke down something incorrect, or the software developer misunderstood something previously. So once the software developer had finished his design document, he had requested a design review meeting with the business owner and a security architect in the beginning. And we were able to prevent a lot of misunderstandings and catch a lot of potential security vulnerabilities before they got actually implemented. Okay, so this layer had been added. The next layer, we decided to add threat modeling. So we started training our software developers and inevitably our business owners as well to perform threat modeling during the design review meetings. And we decided to go with Microsoft Stripes, which stands for spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information leakage, denial of service, and elevation of privilege. And that turned out to be quite useful. It took us about probably five or six weeks, at least, until uh, they were fully able to just do it themselves. And then what we did is we requested, if you're doing modification to some sensitive parts, either authentication related or encryption related, credit card related, uh, payment card related, or some of the following sensitive things, we want you to notify us and bring along a security architect. Okay, so once this was in place, we added another layer. We started to do secure code auditing with focus on IT security. And at least in our case, it wasn't quite realistic to do code auditing on every single code that was modified. So the approach that we took is we did a risk assessment, we tried to evaluate where can external actors actually uh, add some input to our product? And where, you know, where are sensitive places like authentication, encryption, handling of sensitive data? And based on that, whenever source code in those areas was modified, we would do a code audit on, on those code changes. And sometimes if, if we had extra time, which was rare, we would do a random code audit of something else. So the final, final layer that we decided to do was start doing penetration testing before releasing our products. And a little bit of fussing as well. And uh, as I assume you can understand, this uh, now become quite a huge thing. 
and it was working very well internally. But we, I mean, you should look into external factors as well. So if you have clients, you want to make sure that there's a communication channel between you and your clients to notify each other about security vulnerabilities. If you detect security vulnerability in your product, you want to make sure that before you discover it, you actually have the contact information, such as email addresses, of the operational people of your client. So that you can just have a simple mailing list and you can send out emails to notify people about security vulnerabilities. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is you want your clients and possibly other people to be able to let you know if they find a security vulnerability in your software or your services. So one thing you can do is you could have something on your website. Please notify me if you find security vulnerabilities. Thanks. But obviously that can be misunderstood. So some people might think, oh, you're just giving me, like, I'm allowed to try to hack your stuff and um, just let you know if I find something. So try to be specific. You might want to say, you know, you don't want, you don't allow anyone to do reverse engineering or yada, yada, yada. If you do, however, find security vulnerabilities, we'd really appreciate if you would notify us. And something you also want to do, which uh, people sometimes forget, is you want to include the expected time for you to respond to notifications. So you should say, and put it something that you can like stick to. You should say, like, you're going to respond to security vulnerability notifications within 10 business days or five business days or something like that, that you can actually stick to. At this point as well, you might want to consider having an internal security portal, sort of vulnerability management, where you can map out known security bugs and other potential vulnerabilities so you can keep uh, track in real time. You may want to look into establishing an incident response process. So you can basically plan ahead of time. You can have the process in place, like how you should do forensics, how you should communicate with local law enforcement, uh, you might even want to set up a separate process for assisting your clients if they have a breach. Or you just might want to partner with a security company as well. And I guess the last thing that I would recommend considering are, is a bug bounty. And those of you who are not familiar with the bug bounty, there are companies such as HackerOne or BugCrowd, and they have a huge social network, they have a huge network for security of security researchers that either do security research full-time or part-time and have a full-time job somewhere else. And they establish a connection for your company with these individuals. And it's very similar to the security notification that we mentioned earlier. They will actually help you to map out what is allowed, which servers or which services, which software is within the scope. Um, you know, are automated tools allowed and not allowed, and etc. And then you will have to decide also on you know, what sort of bounties are you going to offer. Is it just name recognition? Are you going to give out t-shirts? Or would you give out $100 for cross-site scripting vulnerability, $500 for magical injection? Obviously, the more monetary incentive you give, the more likely people are to look at your uh, services. But again, you first of all, you want to have your internals working really well. And hopefully, you found most of the vulnerabilities especially if you're going to do uh, monetary compensation, otherwise <laughs> it could get really expensive really fast. Uh, but also you want to make sure that once you get a report about a vulnerability, that you can actually react and fix it. And ideally you should try to be able to fix it within uh, 90 days. That sort of concludes what I want to cover. Um, are there any questions? So you're talking about the admin connection there, isn't it? Security and <coughs> review and testing. Do you take yeah. that into consideration when you're doing your sort of planning and estimations? Well, yeah, so uh, what's the question? Do we do some planning and estimation about the testing itself? Yes, yeah, so like, would that affect estimating time or effort involved in tasks because of these extra layers? Um, yeah, like for the implementation time? Yes, so for example, uh, one of our problems was that we had a lot of deadlines to meet. So we didn't have a lot of resources to create the automated testing. So, I mean, if you think about it, to do manual testing, a lot of things takes time. But if you were able to automate it, so if you have the resources to first automate the test, and ideally whenever you're, if you have the time and you have the resources, whenever you create a new function, you should ideally at least do a unit test, and then preferably an automatic test as well, like a functional test, 
So if you do that, that will that should speed up time as well. Definitely. Anything where you can save time is good. And there's even there are even tools out there like um, Veracode. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that. If you have the budget for those, uh, they do statistical analysis of uh, your binaries. So you just compile them with use a tool from that. You compile them, compile them with uh, deep information and uh, send it to them, and they will identify, you know, SQL injections, buffer overflows, all these sort of different things. Of course, they cannot identify logic vulnerabilities, but they're very useful in what they do. So if you do, if you have the budget and you do this early on, you can actually use that as sort of training for your for your employees. So it all comes down to how much money you have, uh, or how fancy you can make your stuff. Yeah. So I work for a company with a kind of a similar system in place. We would do secure development and so on. But one issue we've always hit with the uh, project using Agile is you mentioned doing a project or a design review with your security architect. How do you balance that against Agile and evolving designs and iterative construction? Yeah, so the way we, I mean, for us, it turned out to be very, very easy. I mean, it, uh, for some reason, we were lucky. It just everybody, like, we sold people on the idea. And the way we did it is we just said, we want you to document as little as possible. That's the same thing as I mentioned earlier, whenever you formalize something, like, please don't put any text in there. It doesn't have to be there. But just so that people can understand, you know, what you're talking about. So the creating a design document for a function shouldn't take more than half an hour. And then the business owners were very accessible as well. So that played a, played a big part. If, if, you, if you're unable to get access to your business owners, that particular uh, part, then of course it could be difficult. So the problem we would have would be people would review, do their design, review it to the security architect, the security architect would be like, yes, that's, you've covered, you've mitigated your threats. And then when the people actually implement, say, five months later, they've completely changed it, they're bypassing this thing, all of a sudden there's new threats in there that were never called out to the security. Ah, yeah, that means that's, that's a very interesting, uh, interesting point. And it can be difficult to work around, but the best way that i found is basically education. The, the sooner you catch on to this, because usually, People are not intentionally doing this. Either they're they're being pressed with unrealistic deadlines, they had an original design that to just see, oh, it's just gonna take too long to do it in a secure way, and I have to you know return this tomorrow. So you do have have to have management support in order to do this as well. And at least in my experience, I think if you get the support to do things correctly, unless there's some real big race with a nearby competitor, it's usually always worth wait just in a few more days to get the fixes in um, before you put it out. Do it correctly, yes. My question to you is the implementation of Yeah, so what we did is, um, before that, we had already had a couple of sessions with secure coding. 
So people are a bit, we've given some demonstrations of certain vulnerabilities, so there was certain understanding already in place. So that was just of like, oh, Stripe, like this stands for that, so like, it sort of was more like a checklist. And I believe we downloaded the, the cards that you can get from Microsoft, like, it uh, didn't work that well, but it helped some people like clicking through them. But it was more just an exercise during those meetings. And so the, the sign review meetings got a bit longer in the beginning, where you would just, again, like you would go through every single possible threat, and you would sort of brainstorm. Remember the, you know, this particular incident that we discussed, that was because of this sort of thing, and it could happen like this. Just do something like this, that, that could be in this code or this modification. So it was just, yeah, just repeating a lot of the stuff that we already covered in the secure coding training, and just trying to get people to think. And we were doing two week sprints, so they were always, so yeah, that, so people were always doing this threat modeling, at least for a few weeks, and then they were supposed to continue it afterwards, which I believe the more or less did. But uh, our goal was just to get this into the mindsets. Developers. So I'm pretty sure that we could have actually told them, okay, you don't have to do the threat modeling now and the design review meetings anymore. Because at some like at some point they actually they had the understanding, but we decided to keep it in there anyway, so they just did it faster uh, in case something would slip up. Yeah, so what he is talking about is, is very valuable as well. So uh, the threat modeling that we did was not the design phase, but you should also be doing it after you've implemented it. You look at your own system. And we sort of did that in the penetration testing part, that we were always doing threat modeling in our minds where we realized we're not only like, oh, is this one ability there, we're gonna do this and that. Um, but yeah, it's just like repetitiveness again and again. So yeah, I think we're out of time. So just thank you all for showing up.